Good morning, Refuge Church. It's wonderful to be with y'all. We are celebrating the semi-biblical holiday of Easter or Resurrection Sunday today. Um, some of us might have grown up with no Easter at all or Resurrection Sunday. Some of us might have grown up with it being the biggest day of the year in the church where Christians all like summon all of their energy and try to show off how good we are at partying uh, and etc. So I don't have all the energy of Oprah giving away a hundred cars today, uh, but I do have some great stuff for us to talk about together. Uh, so I'm gonna pray and get us started. <sighs> Lord God, I thank you that you are risen, that you are alive, that that resurrection is available to us. Um, I pray that we would be able to celebrate the fact that you are here and real and present, um, not just a historical moment in the past. I pray that through your spirit that might become real to us um, and that you might teach us whatever we have to learn from your text today, um, from early church history today, whatever it is that you would like to make an impact on our heart. I pray that your will would be done, and that uh, the ground of our hearts might be ready to receive and keep your word. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so like I said, uh, Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to do two parts today. Uh, we're going to do a part where we talk about why is this even one of our major biblical biblical holidays, right? In Christianity, we got Christmas and we got Easter. Those are our big things. The incarnation um, and resurrection. So why is this such a big deal? And we're going to go over that. And then our part two is going to be looking at the actual story or one of the four stories of the resurrection um, and making some observations from it. Okay, so starting out, why is even the resurrection a big deal? Uh, theologically, church-wise, why is it one of the two things that Christianity celebrates every year since we tend to ignore the actual biblical holidays, right? So... Um, resurrection is actually one of the main themes of Christianity. In fact, I'd say the main theme of Christianity for the first thousand years of Christian development. So once we hit the Black Death, massive generational civilization level trauma um, makes people ask questions about suffering, makes people ask questions about death. We get thinkers um, and theologians like Anselm on the scene, and all of a sudden Christianity transforms into a crucifixion-based um, religion, uh, a suffering-based religion. At that point, the gospel changes into what is the gospel, but that Jesus died for you and for your sins, right? That's the moment is the black death, which honestly makes sense. I don't want to throw too much shade <laughs> at those people. Um, they had a lot to grapple with that we can hardly fathom. But before that, um, we can see, especially in art and archaeology and the writings, um, resurrection was this huge concept. The kingdom of God, paradise on earth, all were linked together. So if you have ever been to the Mediterranean and you go to a church that's old enough or well-preserved enough, you'll often see in the domed area of the church, it'll be painted blue and have these different like sparkles for stars, lots of gold and pinks and little clouds. Um, it's really lovely. And Jesus um, sometimes is portrayed as the good shepherd, maybe with a sheep on his shoulders, but he's usually enthroned um, and he's got a globe in his hand to show that he is the ruler. Um, of this beautiful paradise, um, this perfect cosmos that's been created uh, and that he rules via his resurrection. Um, peacocks are often a huge um, Christian art image symbol because A, they're beautiful, um, and that was important back in the day, um, and B, because peacocks at the time were thought to be immortal. Who knew? Uh, and so they were a symbol of eternal life and resurrection because they, um, they never died, just like Christians. Also, when the male peacock opens up their wings, 
Winks, right? Yeah, winks. Um, and it has all those circles on it. Those were thought to be the eyes, like the great cloud of witnesses. So um, Christians who have passed on are always with us. Our ancestors are always with us and they're watching. That was also contained in the peacock image. Um, pretty cool. And lastly, another place that we see Christianity feeling very different, right? We've got peacocks instead of crucifixes. We've got these beautiful, opulent, um, shiny spaces instead of these dark and really buff Jesus, um, bloody focus in the church. We also, at that time, had an enormously common practice of going down to the catacombs, which is where lots of church services were anyway, but having these memorial feasts for slash with the dead. So the idea was we're so focused on the resurrection, so focused on these people who are going to come back and who are still with us. They also believe that the dead still visited through visitations. Um, Augustine was the first person who put the um, kibosh on that because his mom died and she didn't come visit him. And he was like, if this was real, my mom surely would have showed up. Um, so he started a trend that took a while to take off. He was definitely in the minority. Um, but of saying the dead don't come visit Christians. Um, but anyway, so they'd set these beautiful banquet tables with all these chairs um, and they'd include a chair for the dead person and put a candle on it and still put food there because the idea is death is temporary, violence is temporary. Violence that had been done to martyrs um, is something that is wrong and will not remain forever. It will not be victorious. It will be overturned shortly via the resurrection. And so they would have these celebration feasts with the dead to remind them of that. Um, definitely more of a gnarly theme and feel than we carry into modern, modern Christianity today. But you know, we can always revive it. <laughs> Um, okay, but this image, the kingdom and paradise is here and now, death isn't forever, resurrection is an arm, an extension of justice, is something that goes through the whole narrative thread of the text. It's not just an early church thing, it's there the whole time. So, right, the Bible starts with what? A garden, a paradise that we are given to rule when we show up. Um, and it's gorgeous and there is no violence. Um, there's not even any killing of animals. The animals don't harm one another, etc. Um, it's gorgeous and we have chapters of that before things take a turn, right? Um, the tabernacle and the temple are built to replicate this paradise, this place, this kingdom um, where God's presence is, um, where everything is right. So they're built with these beautiful colors and the trees represent pillars and the, um, uh, the, the lanterns, the lamps, the menorahs, there it is. The menorahs are built with little flowers boop, 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 all over them because they're emulating this garden, this paradise. Um, when we get to the prophets, they are continually, even in their darkest moments, foretelling of a time where violence will end and justice will reign and this paradise, um, this kingdom will be continual all over the earth. We've been focusing on the end of Isaiah, right? Isaiah 61, where Jesus parked is where we have been parked in the series on the kingdom of God. But Hosea, uh, I'll read from briefly, Hosea 2.18, on that day I will make a covenant for them with the wild animals, the birds of the sky, the creatures that crawl on the ground. Genesis imagery, right? I will shatter the bow, the sword, and the weapons of war in the land, and will enable the people to rest securely. So all beings are being brought into this, invited into this new space in the midst of being literally slaves, in exile, imprisoned. They're dreaming of and laying claim to this paradise, this kingdom, this other world. Um, that included in a world where violence and death was a continual reality and being murdered was a continual reality. Physical resurrection was an extension of that justice and part of that paradise. 
So we see that all the way back in Isaiah 26. There's other passages, but this one's very clear that it's not metaphorical. It says, your dead will live, um, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust will awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the fallen. Uh, pretty clear, right? <laughs> it's not a big confusion there about um, what they're speaking about. Resurrection is part of this paradise, part of this state of being, this world in which all is right again as it once was. Jesus, when he arrives on the scene, of course, as we've been talking about um, for the past who knows how long, proclaims that paradise and the kingdom, right, is now, is real and is accessible for those who have eternal life. He defines eternal life not as some future state, but as knowing God, um, uh, receiving the one he has sent and loving one another in the ways that um, he has loved us. Like in John 17, he says, this is eternal life. Oh, that's always nice to have a definition from Jesus, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He goes on to pray that we might share the love that he has for us with one another. Um, so that is the access point. The kingdom is within us. It's the access point to being able to experience this other realm. Um, and that's why he goes around healing, casting out demons, setting people free. It's all part of this other realm that he is showing us is not some future place, but is in the here and now. He also declares that he is the light. He's the bread. He's the good shepherd. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the way and the vine. All of these are also images of paradise that empire um, tried to co-opt uh, as well but there are pictures right bread light vines of this other space he's saying that he is the entry point to this other space so while uh, uh, this is for now it also includes physical resurrection um, when he raises Lazarus from the dead or before he's about to he tells Mary I'm the resurrection the one who trusts in me will live even if they die um, again that's pretty clear it doesn't seem metaphorical it doesn't seem like some spiritual imagery it seems pretty straightforward moving on when we get to Paul's epistles his letters one of his grand themes is whether we will align ourselves with the spirit of life which animates this paradise which raised Jesus from the dead right Romans 8 and if we align ourselves in our power with that God's power then we are moving in this space and if we choose to align our power with that of empire we're continuing to reject eternal life um, and collaborate with the forces of destruction. Book author Paul, that's one of his big themes. Revelation, we've gone through the whole thing. Revelation, very end of the book, um, again, talks about this paradise fully restored and permanent. And one of the big themes is the justice being walked out through resurrection. We have all of these martyrs who are now seated with Jesus, who are now reigning and ruling alongside him. It's an extension. Something wrong was done to them. They were trampled down and now they are lifted up, right? Um, and so that's our big picture overview. That's why resurrection is important. That's why Christianity cycles around Easter every year, Resurrection Sunday every year. It's because one of our main themes um, is that death is not the end. Violence is bad. Um, it's not the way things are supposed to be. Suffering is not the intended reality for God's people. And it's a perversion whenever we say that it is or it should be and it builds character, blah, blah, blah. That's not the idea um, throughout the whole tenor of this text. Um, but rather that light and life is what triumphs. Resurrection is a extension of justice and we are invited to participate in it through eternal life, through knowing Jesus and participating with him in the acts of kingdom, we can experience that paradise here and now today. And we experience that resurrection as well. So that's the big picture. If you are, um, have trouble with holding all those things in your head, that is okay. We'll continue to go over these things as we are still in the kingdom of God series. But what I want to do now is I want to turn our eyes over to an actual text discussing the resurrection of Jesus um, and see what it has to teach us this morning. 
Okay, so this one is from Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. It says, Now, after the Shabbat, at the dawning of the first day of the week, Miriam the Migdal and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came up and rolled away the stone and was sitting on it. Now his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And the guards trembled from the fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying, and go quickly. Tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, the Galil. You will see him there. Behold, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them saying, Greetings. They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers that they should go to Galilee and there they will see me. Okay, so we know from comparing all the other texts, first off, that there are other women. It's not just these two Miriams. Um, there's also Joanna is there, Salome is there, all these other wonderful characters who get skimmed over. The entourage of women, basically, who follow Jesus are the ones who are being faithful. So huge first lesson for us, even in the darkness of this horrible moment um, where all hope seems lost, all sorts of despair happening. The disciples have all left. Peter has denied Jesus. Even in the midst of that, these women are still being faithful. They're still loving their friend. Um, other passages tell us that they're bringing spices to prepare his body. So they're still attending to the rabbi. They're still caring for him. Um, and they're still following him and honoring him, even in the dark. Um, I think that's pretty instructive for us sometimes in the darkness of whatever we're walking in at the moment or struggling with, whether that's deconstruction or something even heavier. Um, we can be invited through the example of these women to still be faithful, to still show up. Um, also, I did pay attention to saying Miriam the Migdal. There is a the there in the Greek. Migdal is a Hebrew word that means tower. Um, there's a prophecy, I believe, about Mary in the end of the prophets. I'm talking about a tower that will lead the sheep. And so she is called the Migdal. Um, anyway, the Magdalene should at least be there, but... Whatever. Okay, so it's Miriam and all these other women have gone. They are being faithful. They also, as long as we're talking about these ladies, are the first preachers. Um, they're referenced as such in all of the early church writings. The first preachers, the first leaders, the first uh, pastors, instructors, people who came with the good news, evangelists, any of those words that you would like um, were women. They were told to go and instruct and not only tell the disciples what had happened, uh, but also what they were to do next. Uh-oh, how bossy of them, uh, facetious. I say. Um, so before these men even get their fingers in there, um, they already have the honor, not just of being witnesses to the resurrection, but being the one to go and teach others about it. So um, Yuram, the Migdal, is often referred to as the first preacher um, in these early church texts, which is very fun. It would take until the year 529 at the Council of Orange for uh, women to be barred from being ordained in the church. So it took 500 years. Um, and also at the next council, they had to re-ratify that decision. So clearly it hadn't been listened to. So uh, not part of the early church to keep women out of teaching roles. <laughs> Just including that, hopefully it brings you some joy. Maybe not, and that's okay too. All right, so looking at this text again, we got some craziness. We have a great earthquake, you know, just thrown in there. Um, earthquake, if you look concordance it, go on BLB, 
type in earthquake, see what comes up. Um, it's connected to the day of the Lord, and it's really cool because often it's followed with like, and then the great judgment came down. And here we have the opposite. It is the day of the Lord. We do have a big earthquake, but what happens instead? Instead of a giant sword coming and defeating all of God's enemies, instead they're invited into this new reality. It's pretty cool. Okay, so there's a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came up, rolled away the stone that he was sitting on. Um, so why is this guy even there? Um, couldn't it have just been Jesus hanging out? Uh, yes, but the use of this angel imagery is a callback to the Garden of Eden, right? When they are kicked out of the Garden of Eden, which by the way, if we read that story in Hebrew, we would know that there's no door into Eden. Um, there's no gate. There's only an opening, right? And here we have also an opening. But instead of guarding the door to paradise, right? The door to kingdom, the door to the way that things should be with a giant sword. This time the angel is there present, but he's sitting aside. If the way has been opened and we're invited into that space, but that space right where Jesus' body used to be doesn't confine paradise. It's everywhere. It's all around. They're told to go to Galil, um, kind of helps keep them from worshiping this site, right? Go to Galilee. That's where Jesus is now. Um, it's spread. It's everywhere. Uh, and the women are invited to participate in that rather than being shut out. So we have an echo of the Garden of Eden there. Okay. Um, okay. So the women, amazingly, um, I mean, I don't know what y'all would do in this situation, but they listen um, they don't, it doesn't say, ask any questions. They just respond uh, by departing quickly with fear and great joy, and they run to tell everybody else. Jesus then meets them, and they get to have another experience with him. Um, so I'm not saying that questions are bad. Questions are a big part of who we are at Refuge Church, uh, is opening the door to say, asking questions and trying to figure it out and being honest about where we are sharing and trying to find out more and being um, vulnerable and open with, hey, this is what I'm not getting right now. That's a big part of our DNA. So I'm not saying that asking questions is bad. Um, however, I think there is something amazing and beautiful about the faith of these women um, that they don't park themselves here with this angel um, and be like, y'all, you just said that he's been talking about this the whole time. I don't know if that's true. Can you explain some things? Where did he go? Right? There's no um, long exposition about what happened <laughs> during the resurrection. It's just, he's not here anymore. Go and do the thing. And they go do the thing. And that is laudable and beautiful as well. Questions are not bad or dirty or something that we should be ashamed of. But there's also something to celebrate about instant trust. Um, not in what preachers say. Not in what you've been told is proper doctrine. But instant trust and in an um, experience of God, of a miracle that has just happened and saying, yes, I'm going to go and do this thing. Um, and that can be instructive to us um, because the, none of the resurrection stories, you can go and read them all, Mark, Matthew, uh, Luke, and John, all have their own retelling of this moment, these days. Um, and none of them includes a nice little lore package, right? <laughs> none of it says, okay, here are the different dimensions. This is what happened when Jesus died. There was a big boss battle. He went down, defeated Satan. It was super cool. Um, and But it took three days, and that's why it took a while for him to come back. We don't have any of that uh, explanation. There's no, he was asleep for three days. There's no, he went and like got crowned in heaven. And by the way, these are all the realms and dimensions that exist. That would be super nice for our structures and our theology, but that's not the way that anybody experienced the resurrection, resurrection um, other than Jesus. Uh, and so that's not what we have recorded. And so often that is what our spiritual experience is like. We can say, 
Sometimes we do come up with narratives that help us navigate our story, but sometimes it's not that clean and tidy. Um, and sometimes we're waiting for that. We haven't said yes to deciding, you know what, I am a Jesus follower again. Yes, um, I do want to be all in on these things. Yes, I do identify um, this way and I'm going to re-become maybe comfortable with who I am in the space of faith on this journey. Um, some of us haven't said yes to that because we're still waiting for these questions to be answered. We're waiting for but is God really for me in the same way that I was when I still volunteered at ch church three times a week for hours and was super burnt out? I know God loved me then, but does he still love me now when I haven't been going to church for years since the pandemic, right? Um, why did God allow, if God's the captain of the church, why did the church mistreat me in this horrible way? Um, why does he allow his people to do XYZ. We might still have these questions um, and those are valid questions and legitimate questions and questions that we're invited to bring to God and one another and wrestle through together. We don't have to be ashamed of that. Um, but sometimes we keep waiting and we keep waiting um, just for answers to plop down from above. And these women, because they said yes to trusting, that's when they got to encounter Jesus on the road, on the way back, and see him face to face, right? If they had camped in from the angel and been like, mm -mm, I don't think so. Did the Romans take him? I need some explanations. They wouldn't have seen Jesus on the road, right? They would have never had that experience. So hopefully this Easter, you can be invited to say yes, um, to trust, say yes, to um, running the path to which believe we've been called, um, even when we don't have all the answers yet. And maybe on the way, we'll meet Jesus on the road um, and experience this resurrection for ourselves, not just theologically, but experientially. So I'm going to pray for that. Um, set us free. Uh, hopefully we can have some discussion. Come join us online. If you haven't before, you can fill out a form, refugepullman.com. Um, We'd love to have you on the Zoom, and we'd love even more, of course, uh, to have you in person at Refuge Church. If you've never given before, um, we'd also so deeply appreciate that. And there's also a link, a little floating bubble that says give on it, refugepullman.com. And we'd be so blessed if you would um, invest in what we're trying to do in our community. Um, so I'm going to pray. <sighs> God, I thank you that um, all of this isn't just theological. All of this isn't just cognitive and mental structures of things that we check off. Um, yep, yeah, I believe this and this and this and this and this. And resurrection has to be one of those things or we're not invited. Thank you that we're always invited with all of our questions, um, especially when we're running the path anyway. I pray that you would give us the trust to be able to do that. Some of our trust has been deeply damaged um, by the church, by experiences, by our own doubt. Um, I pray that you would heal and restore that trust so that we might experience that great joy with trembling again, and that we might be able to see you face to face again. We don't wanna just go through the motions of what it means to be a good person or whatever for our whole lives. And we want to know you and you is life and abundance and paradise and kingdom and everything that is beautiful and good. I thank you that you are alive um, and that you invite us into that life with you. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus who lives and reigns. Amen. All right, y'all have a wonderful week. Bye.